talking about, we, I gave you a little bit of the background of the Phocian schism. And um, so first, the Church of Constantinople. This church broke off from the Church of Rome through the machinations of Phocius, and there are his dates, and Michael Cherularius, which I talked about. Phocius, on Christmas Day, Merry Christmas, the year 857, was consecrated a bishop at the instigation of Michael the emperor, who was young and fatuous, and Barda, who ruined the integrity of Michael's morals in order to obtain power. Barda was a rat fink, all right, historically, in that, in that totally corrupt regime. The Byzantine Empire rarely had a decent person uh, at the head of government. Rarely. It was, if you listen, if you read the history of the Byzantine Empire, it is one, it's one plot after the other, one immorality after the other, one stabbing after the other. Uh, it, it, is, it was the, the most corrupt government that ever existed, I think. Totally corrupt. Occasionally, there was a decent one. Rarely. So this barter was just typical of the, of the gross corruption of those regimes in the Byzantine Empire. Phocius was consecrated, A, against what was required by the canons, having been made a bishop only a few days from being a layman, without observance of the proper time intervals. B, to the see of Constantinople, where Ignatius was the legitimate bishop and successor, who was not deposed and did not validly abdicate. So Ignatius was the true patriarch of Constantinople. C, by Gregory of Syracuse, a schismatic bishop whom Ignatius had deposed. So he was consecrated by a schismatic bishop on top of it all. Phocius, although Nicholas the Great, the Roman pontiff, was resisting his prevarication, and I believe he's a saint, the, the Nicholas, managed to remain in the see of Ignatius by evil means. He rebuked the Latins about certain disciplines such as fasting and celibacy. Of course, you know, get rid of that stuff. He criticized the doctrine of the procession of the Holy Ghost, ex patre filioque, as a dogmatic error. He even held that when the emperors transferred from the city of Rome to Constantinople at, the time of the prime, at that time, the primacy of the Roman see transferred also to Constantinople, and with the royal dignities, the privileges of the Roman see were also transferred. So he's the new pope, effectively, because he's the patriarch of Constantinople. You can see from this there there's Caesaropapism. There's a, something called, in history, Caesaropapism. Where the head of state is essentially the pope. And the, the, uh, that was a, a strong influence in the East, is that the emperor uh, is the, the head of the church, effectively. the emperor always wanted his buddies to be bishops. See, so that was the problem in the East. The, in, in the West, the pope was on his own in Rome, but he did have trouble with, uh, in the later Middle Ages, with German bishops wanting to make their buddies bishops. That is, the, the church went from the persecution of the Roman Empire into all of the problems and quasi and sometimes open persecution by supposedly Catholic monarchs 
who wanted to, to control the church. And the popes resisted that constantly. But they, they you know, concept, there was no uh, internet at the time, so Constantinople was far away. The emperor was right there. And, and the, uh, what would typically happen is that bishops would be nominated and the popes would say, okay. That's, uh, that was, uh, the, there were various ways of naming bishops uh, in, in Europe and in the United States too, but uh, in many cases in Europe, they would be elected by the chapter of canons and then Rome would say yes or no. In the US, it was, there were no canons. <laughs> the bishops in this country wanted no canons. So, the the outgoing bishop would give Rome three names, and Rome would take one. Uh, so it was it was, but there was always this at least tacit confirmation by the Holy See. Otherwise, you didn't have you didn't have legitimacy. Photius was deposed in the Eighth Ecumenical Council, eight sixty nine. When Ignatius died, John VIII, the Roman pontiff, and by the way, in that council, I just read the other day, there's a text that says, we bind ourselves not to mention in the canon the names of those who are not in communion with the Roman see. We bind ourselves. So I saw that text the other day, I wanna track it down. When Ignatius died, John VIII, the Roman pontiff, for the peace and usefulness of the Church of God, admitted Photius again as Patriarch of Constantinople with certain conditions. But soon, as fraudulent behavior be began to increase, he was deposed again and ejected from his see, and he again fomented schism. He was exiled in the year 891, and it appears that he died in pertinacity, that he never repented. At the end of the ninth century, the union of the Orientals with the Roman Church was restored. So when they got rid of Photius, the, there was a restored union under Antonius Caulea. But in the middle of the 11th century, Michael Cherularius, Mike Blue, restored the schism. He too came from the lay state to the episcopacy, which means another buddy of the emperor, uh, to the see of Constantinople without the canonical intervals. He conceived in his mind a hatred for the Latins. When this hatred erupted, he attacked the Latins for using unleavened bread in the Holy Eucharist, for eating suffocated meat, for having inserted filioque in the creed, etc. Various other things. Yes. Uh, if there was, uh, I mean, the if the animal was suffocated in order to kill it, there's a whole list of things that Latins do that were horrible and evil and wicked and and disgusting. So you can read about Michael Cherularius if you want. Look him up in the uh, Catholic Encyclopedia. You'll find more about more about it. Okay. He dared to have himself called ecumenical patriarch. Now, the word ecumenical is uh, distorted today, but ecumenical has as its original meaning, or it comes from the Greek word oikumene, which means household. So the ecumenical patriarch means the universal patriarch. See, that's why you have an ecumenical council. That means one of the whole church, not a local council the whole household. See, but ecumenical has taken on this idea of bringing people, to, the heretics together with Catholics. And it, it's, I mean, that's a true meaning today, but you have to distinguish that from its original meaning. By stirring up many minds which were implicated in the Phocian cause, he led them into a schismatic spirit. So in the year 1054, on the 16th of July, the legates of Leo IX placed the sentence of excommunication upon Cerularius on the altar of Santa Sophia, 
in Constantinople. So they put it on the altar, the decree of excommunication of Cherularius. Which that thing is now a mosque. Uh, thanks to all of the corruption of the those Greek emperors. Cherularius in the year 1059 was sent into exile by Isaac Comnenus, the emperor, and he died shortly thereafter. He was praised by subsequent schismatics. The disaster of dissidents infected the entire East. Photius assigned 10 crimes to the Latins, Cherularius 22, and the Cetas Sedus uh, at the beginning of the 12th century, 32. The accusations increased a great deal in the 13th century. In the 14th century, 600 heresies <clears throat> of the Roman Church were brought up. <clears throat> Most of all, the authority of the Roman Pontiff was repudiated. So many times, the Supreme Pontiffs did everything they could to reconcile the schismatics. Mostly in the Second Council of Lyons, 1274, which we talked about yesterday, and the Council of Florence, 1439. Mark of Ephesus, by his instiga instigations, ruined the noble work of Eugene IV and Nicholas V. See, they brought about the union. They, the, the schismatics signed on to union. All of the bishops uh, uh, that were there and representing other bishops, but the, you know, there was the, uh, it was a, a, a general reunion uh, of the schismatics with the Roman Church, except for Mark of Ephesus. He was a stinker. And he went back and, and stirred everybody up against the reunion. But also the people of Constantinople didn't want it. That's why it ultimately failed, because they said they would sooner be under the, the Muslims than under the Pope. And that's exactly what happened to them a few years later. In the year 1453, Constantinople was captured by Mohammed II, and the Greek church fell under the yoke of the infidels. The schismatic church, which is called by its own adherents the Eastern Orthodox, now principally remains within the limits of uh, the Turkish Empire. That's the, your book, which is from around 1900. So it's Turkey and the Middle East since 1919. The Russian church, we shall pass over the early attempts at evangelization. The Russian people heard the gospel from priests who belonged to the Patriarchate of Constantinople in those times when the Eastern church was joined to the Roman church. So it was evangelized by Catholics, Eastern Catholics, but nonetheless Catholics. Yes. They were earlier than the uh, evangelization of, um, of Russia. They were earlier than that. Uh, but the original, there, there was a, um, some king of Kiev, I forget his name, who um, converted uh, to uh, Catholicism, Eastern Catholicism. And so the original Russia, because, you know, the original Russia is actually Ukraine. <laughs> I don't know if you know that. Kiev is, is, the, is the, you might say, the original Russia. Moscow and the Moscovite kingdom developed later. And then St. Petersburg was much later. But the, the, the Kiev was, is really the, the, the root, particularly of the Russian church, in other words, of, of Russian Christianity is Kiev, not Moscow. Mm -hmm. Even at the time of Napoleon, most of the buildings in Moscow were made of wood. That's why it went up in flames so nicely. I mean, it was a pretty sorry place, Moscow, uh, until uh, well, in the 19th century, it, 
the, the tremendous wall, as a matter of fact, around the Kremlin was built after Napoleon in order to protect the Kremlin from a, another attack. So those walls and those towers, each of those towers has a name. And oddly, when I was there, they had alternating on the, on the top of the tower, the red star, and the next tower would have the eagle, the eagle being, of course, representing old Russia, imperial Russia, and the red star, of course, representing revolutionary Russia. And that, that's about it in Russia right now, is, is you sort of have a, a, a mixed bag right, of revolution and, and imperial Russia. So anyway, uh, the, um, um, so that's, so for this reason, uh, Michael I, Leontius, John, and Theo uh, Pemptus, who were the first metropolitans of Kiev, were linked peacefully with the Church of Rome. So, uh, God bless you. So Rome was, uh, excuse me, Kiev was originally Catholic. The same must be said of Hilarion, George I, John II, John III, and Ephraim, the successors of Theopemptus. Nikifor I, the Metropolitan of Kiev, is considered to be the principal author of the Russian schism. In the end, the germs of the Greek schism were spread throughout Russia, but the schism was not approved by all. In 1439, Isidore signed the decrees of the Council of Florence as Metropolitan of Kiev and of all Russia. Now, there's an interesting story with regard to that. There is a, uh, there's a Saint Sergei among the Russians. And the, the Novosordites... Uh, love this, uh, or the conservative Novosordites, because they say Pius XII permitted this Saint Sergei. Uh, and I went to the, this monastery, the Sergiev Posad, a beautiful, absolutely beautiful thing. That's where uh, the young Peter I had to hide from his mother who wanted to kill him. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, things are, you know, politics is a little rough in Russia. So, the uh, so, oh, Pius XII permitted a schismatic saint to be in the, moder the Eastern martyrology. The reason he did was that, that for a time, Russia was reconciled, and he died, therefore, as a Catholic. In other words, he died at the time that Russia was reconciled to the Roman See. That's why he permitted it into the... I looked at but, oh, we have a systematic in the, you know, Pius XII. <laughs> okay. So in the year 1458, the Metropolitan See of Kiev was divided into two parts with the effect that the Metropolitan of Moscow would rule northern Russia. It may have been his sister that wanted to kill him. I think it was his sister. I think, I, you know, sis wanted to knock him off. I think so. Let me correct that. It was either his mother or his sister, but uh, you know, maybe both. But it was a power thing. So, you see, Russia never had a system of succession. You see, the first czar was um, uh, somebody by the name of Michael in the early 1600s. Uh, and the uh, first Romanov czar, I shouldn't say. First Romanov czar. And by the way, in Russian, that's pronounced Romanov. Uh, the first Romanov uh, czar was uh, Michael so-and-so. But they never had a system of succession where it was just whoever got there first, whoever got to the throne first pretty much was it. So the Romanovs managed to hold on to that for over 300 years, that throne, uh, by you know, the usual knocking off of people that were in the way and you know, taking care of things and... Uh, you know, mysterious deaths and whatnot, but they managed to hold on to it. So that's just a footnote about that. So uh, <clears throat> it's divided into two parts with the effect that the, the metropolitan of Moscow would rule northern Russia and that of Kiev would rule southern Russia. 
the Metropolitans of Moscow were inclined to union with the Church of Rome. Those of Kiev, from Isidore to Jonas II, were not opposed to the decrees of Florence. In fact, Isidore himself and Gregory II and Joseph II, the Sultan, labored in order that the union be propagated and confirmed. From Jonas II to the depos deposition uh, of Onesiphorius, schism prevailed in the Sea of Kiev. Then finally, the greater part of the Russians or Ruthenians who gave obedience to the Metropolitan of Kiev sought union. Under Clement VIII, that's about 1600, the Roman pontiff, all the bishops who pertained to the uh, to the Metropolitan See of Kiev, except two, return to unity. But the Uniates to this day have often undergone persecution. So. But again, that's a church completely dominated by the state ever since particularly uh, Peter the Great. Peter the Great uh, established the Synod, which was the bishops of, of, you know, a collection of some bishops of uh, Russia. And, of course, he was the, the head of the Russian church. It's because religion in those times had a tremendous effect, obviously, on the people. So for, uh, the, the monarchs couldn't bear, especially absolute monarchs, couldn't bear the idea of such an enormous influence on the people over which they did not have control. So, so then the, that, that's when the Patriarchate of Moscow, he established the Patriarchate of Moscow. Well, that may have been uh, earlier. But uh, there was a Patriarchate of Moscow, not recognized by the Catholic Church. Uh, and that continued until Stalin did away with it, I believe it was Stalin, in the early 1920s. But then he resurrected it in 1943 uh, in order to get the religious spirit of Russia going in order to overcome the Niemiecki, who were the Germans. See, so he was using religion, but that uh, it was all... Uh, the bishops were all KGB people, and, or it wasn't KGB at the time, but the secret police. And this was told to me by Russian seminarians who were here. That the, you can't trust Russian Orthodox sacraments because the bishops and many of the priests, etc., were KGB. And even, the, I was told when I was in Russia, that the present uh, patriarch is a KGB agent. <laughs> Yeah, his whole life he was a KGB agent, or you know, his prior life. Yes, you have a question? No? Okay. So anyway, uh, that the, you know, they had no training whatsoever. I mean, their training was in the KGB camps. That was their theological training. <laughs> so, you know, you can't trust any of their sacraments. Uh, so yes, the Uniates, the, uh, the Catholic Church managed to exist, however, in Russia... Uh, the uh, Catherine the Great permitted the Jesuits to continue uh, even after they were suppressed and there was a technicality about that uh, and, and the popes looked the other way. See, Clement the... Clement, no, it was Clement the 8th, 9th, Clement the 14th suppressed the Jesuits in 1774, I think it was. And, uh, but then he died quickly thereafter. Then Pius VI became Pope. And everyone knew that that was a big mistake. But the monarchs were so against the, the Jesuits, the, the big monarchs of Europe, Portugal, Spain, uh, France, and uh, Austria. Those were your big Catholic countries. Uh, they, uh, they didn't want the Jesuits for all the wrong reasons. And so they, of course, you know, they didn't want to upset them. So, uh, but uh, they continued to exist in Prussia 
and in Russia. And the Pope looked the other way. <laughs> he didn't say anything because Catherine the Great said, I am not promulgating this in Russia. So anyway, that's another footnote. Uh, so, uh, so they continue to exist and uh, uh, even under the czars, there was a uh, there was permitted to build a Catholic cathedral in Moscow, which I saw. It fell into desuetude and and disrepair during the communist times, but then it was all fixed up again and, and it's functioning now as a Novus Ordo church. But they also had a seminary under the czars in Saint Petersburg. So there there were Russian Catholics, but they. Uh, everything came from Poland. All of their, their religion, so to speak, customs, everything was from Poland. You see, there was no indigenous Catholic culture in, in, in Russia. So ev everything was taken from Poland. And uh, the, uh, uh, so, um, yeah, so they had a, actually a seminary in, in, uh, under the czars, but the czar, they were very much stifled Catholicism was stifled in uh, Russia under the czars. Uh, and uh, the, um, the, there was actually, I was told by these Russians, that the, uh, when Kerensky came in, the Catholics were all happy because Kerensky said freedom of religion. <laughs> so there was a time for about you know, eight months or nine months where you had a Kerensky government. And... Um, uh, and uh, they could have the, there's actually a picture of having the Corpus Christi procession in St. Petersburg, which was never permitted under the czars. Also, the Russian Catholics had only celibate clergy and traditional Latin mass because the czar would not permit them to have a, an Eastern Rite mass that would compete with the Russian Orthodox. So they had only Latin masses. Just a little interesting thing about Russia. So, um, in the year 1589, when Jeremiah II, the Patriarch of Constantinople, raised the See of Moscow to a Patriarchate, Job, the Metropolitan of Moscow, was created the first Patriarch of that See by Theodore I, the Emperor. In the instrument of erection, we see written that old Rome was infected with the heresy of Apollinaris, imagine, and that new Rome, or Constantinople, was under the yoke of the Turks. But that Moscow has become the third Rome. So Moscow was considered the third Rome. Obviously the center of everything, therefore. One discerns as well that the first patriarch is, uh, is that of Constantinople, the second of Alexandria, the third of Moscow, the fourth of Antioch. So now he's part of the, the patriarch group. All right the fifth of Jerusalem, the false pastor of the West, the Roman pontiff, is spurned. So, so he's just dirt for them, okay? So that's the history of that church. In the year 1721, Peter I, called the Great, the emperor, abolished the Patriarchate of Moscow and established the spiritual college, that is, the permanent synod of St. Petersburg, which institution is of such a nature that all of the authority of ruling spiritual affairs devolves to the Russian czar. So he actually made himself effectively the patriarch. I do not say this in such a way as to mean that they hold the, to the doctrine of Caesaropapism, but I have merely pointed out the obstacles to liberty. So in fact, it was Caesaropapism if they didn't actually practice it. From the year 1878 on, there were seven members of the synod, three metropolitans, two archbishops, two proto proto-popes. Uh, the, there's a term in the Eastern Rite called a pope, and that is uh, essentially a priest. Uh, they call them popes. And it's a, the French use that term for an Eastern Rite priest, a pope. So, so don't get too... Uh... There were also four assessors, of which one is an archbishop, one is a bishop, and two are laymen. There is always present at the synod a supreme procurator or his vicar, who can render the decrees null by his veto if the decree should displease the czar, who is the head of the synod. And so that's the way it worked. The Eastern schismatics and the Russians come under the common name of Phocians. 
There is almost no pure schism. Although we are accustomed to consider the Phocian churches uh, in the Phocian churches only their schism, and although all of the evil of these churches takes its origin in the fact that they refuse submission to the Roman pontiff, in general the schismatic churches cannot be considered to be immune from the infection of error. So that's almost always true of schism, because once you detach yourself from the standard of truth, well, then things happen. People start to wander doctrinally. For the Orientals and Russians deny, first, that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and from the Son as from a unique principle and by a unique spiration. You will study that in De Trinitate. Right? Two, they deny that by the pains of purgatory, those souls who have truly satisfied for sins which they have committed and omitted by the fruits of penance are truly purged. And when I was in Russia, there were, there, I saw that there was, uh, went, uh, saw some chapel and that there was something about praying for the dead. So I said to these Russian seminarians, why do you pray for the dead in the Russian Orthodox Church if you don't believe in purgatory? Oh, well, you know. They, they couldn't explain it either. It's just that it's a nice thing to do. But they were praying for the dead. <laughs> it was in a Russian Orthodox Church. <laughs> All right. And three, they deny that the Roman pontiff is the true vicar of Christ and the head of the whole church and the father and doctor of all Christians, which is a doctrine of the church. For in what regards the epiclesis, that is, those prayers which follow the words of our Lord, this is my body, in the Phocian liturgies, most err by holding that the epiclesis is necessary for the consecration of the Eucharist. See that there's no true consecration unless uh, there is a, an epiclesis, that the consecration doesn't even take place until the epiclesis is there. Although the Orientals in the decree of Florence profess that the words of our Lord have all the power of transubstantiation. So, yes? In this case, the epiclesis is the words, this is my body, or is it? No, there's a prayer uh, to the Holy Ghost after the consecration in the Eastern Rite liturgies. That's known as the epiclesis. It, it occurs in the Roman, but before the uh, Veni Sancte Spiritus or Veni Creator or whatever, the, the, there's a, an invocation of the Holy Ghost in the offertory. Right? It, it, that's the equivalent of it. But it is accidental to the, to the consecration, words of consecration. In what regards worship, Clement VIII declares in his Bull of Union with the Ruthenian nation, with the Roman Church, all the sacred rites and ceremonies which the Ruthenian bishops and the clergy use according to the institutions of the Holy Greek Fathers in their divine offices and in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass and in the administration of the rest of the sacraments and in other functions, provided that they are not against the truth and doctrine of the Catholic faith and do not exclude communion with Rome, we permit, concede, and indulge to the same Ruthenian bishops and to the clergy from our apostolic kindness. So again... They just take the whole thing. Clement VIII, the 1600, uh, just took the whole Ruthenian church. Lock, stock, and barrel, as they say in English. Okay. In other words, with just the bishops, the priests, everything. In that union. So, as I said, the church was very successful in the past. <laughs> Uh, in in reuniting certain schismatic groups, um, the uh, for example, the heretics at Graymore, there was an Anglican community in uh, upstate New York in Graymore. They they came in under Pius X uh, with the influence of Cardinal Mary Delvell. The mark of unity does not pertain to the schismatic churches. Arguments, w argument one, 
in the Phocian churches, there is no principle of ecclesiastical unity. Therefore, they lack the note of unity, proof of the antecedent. The principle of unity among the schismatics is either one of the patriarchs or all the patriarchs together or the synods, but none of these can be considered to be an efficacious principle of unity. A, not one of the patriarchs. None of the patriarchs is the head of the whole church by a divine right. No scripture, no father teaches that the supreme authority lies with any of the Phocian patriarchs. Where is your tradition? We're saying that authority lies with the Phocian patriarchs. The, the patriarch of Constantinople wasn't even around when those fathers were writing. Where is the scriptural basis for a patriarchy? Thou art patriarch. <laughs> Where do they get this? B, not all the patriarchs together. Nowhere do we read in sacred scripture or the fathers that the church has been confided to four or five patriarchs. Two, it is necessary that there be one through whom all these patriarchs are united into one. You need a, uh, to have a single institutional church, you need a single head. That's the point. There are 16 Eastern churches, schismatic churches. So when you say the, the, the Eastern Orthodox, uh, you're, you're talking to about 16 different organizations. And sometimes there's sub-organizations of those. Not synods. A synod, a synod by the way, is, uh, uh, just means a, a, a council. That's a, it comes from syn in Greek, which is, it comes up this way in transliterated sin and hodos which means path or road so you come together you know it's a the say the uh, methodos method comes from that too see meta hodos through what road meta is through or uh, according to so the word method comes from that learning greek really helps your vocabulary by the way so in your spare time you should learn classical Greek. Um, <clears throat> so a synod, um, although it should be universal, lacks its divine principle of unity because it rejects a visible supreme head. So again, it's just a meeting of independent bishops. Two, it is necessary that the principle of unity be permanent but the general councils are had only from time to time. More than a thousand years have elapsed since the last valid council recognized by the Phocians, Nicaea, the, the second of Nicaea, 787. And the reason they say that is because that's the last council they will recognize because that's the last council in which Rome was in communion with them. And they say because Rome is detached now, you can't have a general council because it would not be a general council. Figure that out. So they have had no general councils. We will not recognize any because it's impossible. Now because of the growing number of autonomous schismatic churches, there are 14, the dif difficulty of calling a synod increases every day. In the end, who will call the council? Who will preside over it? The majority of the Russian theologians think that an ecumenical council is morally impossible, if not absolutely impossible. The councils which are truly ecumenical have very often declared that the supreme power rests with the Roman pontiff. The councils which were held before Photius and Cherularius declare this more than once. The Council of Constantinople, for example, uh, 
uh, Chalcedon, I'm sorry, Chalcedon. Uh, Leo, uh, Peter speaks through Leo. Leo meaning Leo the Great. Because he sent a dogmatic letter to them and it was read at the council. A, that's what it was called, a dogmatic letter. And, and then the reaction of the bishops, was, and, that, and they were practically all Eastern bishops. There were very, very few Western bishops, if any. And they said, Peter speaks through Leo. That was their reaction to that. I add the definition of the Council of Florence concerning the primacy of Rome, to which the three legates of the patriarchs of Constantinople adhered, as well as Isidore of Kiev, the metropolitan of all Russia, 16 Greek metropolitans, that means archbishops, as well as the Orientals who were present with the exception of Mark of Ephesus. So they all signed on to Roman primacy. Joseph, the patriarch of Constantinople, who died during the council when he was near death, professed in a most dignified manner the Pope of old Rome to be the vicar of our Lord Jesus Christ. Argument two from the facts. The Phocians, in fact, lack unity. This is apparent from what is said below. A divided kingdom. The national condition of the church is such that f the faithful are divided in the same way that the nations are divided. But national profession clearly prevails in the Phocian churches, particularly in the Russian church. So just as you have to have baklava in the Greek Orthodox Church, you have to have borscht in the Russian Orthodox Church, which is a beet soup, which I had in Russia. And oddly, they don't call it borscht, but they call it borscht. In Russia, it's borscht. So just a little factoid for you. Right. So I, I thought certainly, so anyway, it's borscht. So you know, the, it is, all of those churches are so tied with ethnicity that they lose their capability of being universal. So the Russians, however, having repudiated the jurisdiction of Constantinople, give obedience only to their synod since 1721. So they broke from Constantinople. The Greeks at a council of bishops in uh, now, in 1833 refused the jurisdiction of Constantinople. There are then at least four groups of Phocians, those of Constantinople, those of Russia, those of Athens, and those of Bulgaria. All told, there are certainly 14 autonomous schismatic churches. I've seen the figure of 16. By the way, just a little point in English. When you say all told, you're not saying this. You're saying all told, that means all added up. All added up. That's what you're saying. Please spell it right or don't use it. All right. But that's what you're saying is all taken together, all, see the word told, for saying, all told. All right. Their faith is not truly one. A group which lacks the principle of unity becomes divided when sects arise within themselves. But in Phocianism, which lacks the principle of unity, many have produced a sect. Ergo, the major is evident for only a principle of unity can have the effect that dissidents either repent once the matter is defined or be expelled from the body. So that has to happen, which is not happening in the Novus Ordo because it's dogmatic. They have abandoned dogma. Is that, that discipline of excluding dissidents is absolutely necessary for the unity of the church. And it's just one more nail in the coffin of the Novus Ordo, that the only people that they want to get rid of are people who are professing the Catholic faith. Every, all of the fire of anathema comes out for people who are rigid. And What did he say the other day? Do not, a few weeks ago, something about 
the, the certainty of the truths of the faith do not become attached to the certainty of the truths of the faith or something like that. Yeah, it was, I'll, I'll get it. I'd have it on my phone. <laughs> the minor is proved. There are about 12 million to 14 million, now this is from 1900, adherents to the sect of the old believers in Russia. The old believers uh, were those who resisted the changes of Peter the Great. See, Peter the Great wanted to westernize Russia. If you recall, he had gone to Holland and so forth and uh, posed as a, uh, just an ordinary person. The man was about seven feet tall. How anybody, and, you know, speaking with a Russian accent, how anybody could be fooled, I'll never know. But I saw his boots in Russia. I mean, they're, they're like this. I mean, the enormous man. And, and uh, so the, I'm sure everybody knew. But in any case, they made believe that they didn't. And he was just one of the guys working on the ship. And uh, so he wanted to westernize Russia. So he came back to Russia and made uh, everybody shave their beards off to be like the Western Europeans. And so that caused a whole you know, a number of other things. He made some reforms in the Russian church, liturgical reforms, etc. And so then you had the old believers, that's what they, they separated, uh, who themselves have divided up into many sects. From the quietism uh, of the followers of Gregory Palamas in the Greek church, which has achieved a broad diffusion. The evil of heresy, therefore, since a legitimate and infallible authority cannot be indicated by the Phocians, publicly and formally adheres to the schism. See, so... In other words, that, that is formal in, a, in something that has no, when I say formal, it pertains to its essence to uh, not only uh, divert from the true faith, but also to be open to all sorts of, of other divisions which in themselves are legitimate. If you divide from authority, why can't somebody else? So, all right, let's quit there.